Hello, everybody, and welcome to Cinema Savvy. It is myself, George, joined once more by Dave for a very special review. Um, as we aren't talking Star Wars once for once with Dave, I do see his amazing poster behind him, but we are reviewing Catch Me If You Can uh, in another entry of the Steven Spielberg retrospective. And before we get into any of that, Dave, how are we doing tonight? Really good, thank you for my friend. It's a bit warm uh, in the UK at the minute, but uh, so I've seen any sweat running down my face. It's just because I'm really fat and it's a bit warm, uh, but it's fine. It's fine. No, I'm really good. Thank you very much for having me back on for it. No, it is an absolute pleasure. When you know when this series took off back in March, I sent a lot of people messages. You know, drop me a list of what ones you're interested in. And when yours came back, I was like, "Oh, catch me if you can." I was like, "I've not seen this for a long time." And as we've got nearer and nearer, I was like, "Yeah, it's, it's, let's get Dave on catch me if you can," because a, a fair amount of requests oh, for this one. It's it's one of those films where you know, I mean, we'll get into memories later on, but it's just it's such a nice. One. There's nothing bad to say about this film. Uh, it, it's one of those, and I feel like it's a film that. Even if people aren't familiar with it, they've all heard of it or maybe seen it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's a, it's it's probably it's a really easy watch for a Spielberg film. I think it doesn't have yeah. too much. It has a lot going on, but not too much. It's not overly complicated with that plot. So yeah, it fires along at such a good pace. It's uh, I'm sure we'll get that in a bit. But uh, yeah, it's a it's a really lovely film. No, definitely. And to everybody watching at home, we want to hear your thoughts on Catch Me If You Can, so please do comment everything about this film, with the first time you saw it, whether you enjoy it, and perhaps you maybe even dislike it. We want to hear all of that from yourself, so please do get involved. This is one a lot of people have been looking forward to. And if you're a fan of Steven Spielberg, maybe a fan of Tom Hanks and Leonardo DiCaprio, we're probably going to have more videos for all of these guys. Definitely Spielberg and Tom Hanks, but we'll get into Leo in a little bit. Uh, so consider hitting that subscribe button. And at the time this video coming out, it will be, oh God, the 23rd of August. We're pre recording this quite far in advance. Uh, we're really moving on with some of this stuff. So there is a heat wave happening, as Dave has said. We've got these lovely upgraded 1080p cameras now on StreamYard, which makes it even more obvious for when things do get hot and, and sweaty. So, yeah, it's uh, it's going to be one of those. And we're going to find out about what videos are coming up soon and, and what else we're working. I'm trying to think what's happening on the 23rd of August. So we were going to have Cassian, but uh, that's all been moved through to September. Yeah. Um, but if we had any videos announced about Cassian, maybe pop a, and have a look on our social media. That's Twitter and Instagram at Cinema and School Savvy. Facebook and Lebrox.com slash Cinema Savvy. Link to Redbubble. But I mentioned Cassian a lot. I don't want to tempt fakes. We're pre recording this on the 10th of August. There's a very, very good chance I'm at a big Cassian event on the 24th of August. And if I'm not, you get the embarrassment of watching this later on. And if I am, this is going to look fantastic in advance. And I'll put loads of posts on those social medias. Um, so do check those out. But. Um, as we always do with this series, we're going to put everyone on the spot of a question. Now, Dave, we've just got you on tonight. You have been on before, yeah. so I'm not going to ask you if your sort of Spielberg memories, whatnot. I actually want to kind of ask you something sort of different. Uh, and I had a sort of choice out two actors for this. Uh, what, favorite Leonardo DiCaprio film? Um, Shutter Island. Oh, it's probably my favorite Leonardo DiCaprio performance, definitely. Uh, so yeah, I think that would yeah Shutter Island for me. Interesting. And this is it. I could have said Tom Hanks, but everyone would be honestly thinking for ages. Yeah. Or everyone's going to have the one word answer ready. But it's, uh, yeah, I mean, Leo with Spielberg. We're going to get into that in a bit because it's quite, that's a big, big team up. And we said before we went live, like, they've not done a film together since, which is a massive shame because they're both yeah. two incredible film or filmmaker and actor. And this film as well is, is probably one of Leo's most recognizable roles. And he's had a fair amount of those. So, that's a lovely one. So I would go with Inception. Um, obviously, that's the nearest enemy. But then, if not, probably Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, because that every time I think about that film, that just gets higher and higher and higher <laughs> above my rankings of everything. And we had a Bullet Trainer recently, which I don't recommend. And I was sort of sat there like get Brad Pitt playing, you know, playing his character again. Get Brad Pitt and Leah back together. Quentin, I know you wrote books. Write another film. Do something, please, because we miss them. <laughs> um, but aside from that, uh, what we'll also kickstart this with, uh, we always go with the IMDb plot synopsis. It's catch me if you can. Now, I was kind of shocked. This is probably, I mean, the literal plot is the title, Catch Me If You Can. It's five words long. So I was delighted at the paragraph that IMDb has left us, which reads as follows. <laughs> Barely 21 yet, Frank is a skilled forger who has passed as a doctor, lawyer, and pilot. FBI agent Carl becomes obsessed with tracking down the con man, who only revels in the pursuits. Um, how did that feel to you? Does that feel a bit exaggerated, or should it literally just been like he's on the run? I, I don't think it, it's not quite enough. It doesn't. If that doesn't, to me, sell the movie that you get, it's a. It does have that with the the, the fraud and the 
crazy goes through, but there's so much more to this film than that explanation. That doesn't sell it. Sell it even halfway, to be honest. No, I'm kind of with you. And what I actually want to jump into with yourself is memories of this film. Now, as I said, this has been out 20 years now, released in 2002. I thought it was 03. Obviously, Minority Report would have been up last week, which is also pre-recorded. So I didn't realize that he did Minority Report and Catch Cannon the same year, which is remarkable. <laughs> uh, and we've said that a lot about his films. But he has a habit. Two- yeah, I was going to say, it's not a one-off where he's done two movies in a year that like he's pushed out. Like, oh, my word. Okay. I mean, one set in the six, the 1960s and the other's in the 2050s. Like, how does that even <laughs> blend? I, I don't know. But can you remember maybe like the first time you saw this or this over the years for yourself? Because it's it's a very unique one, this film, I feel. Yeah, I, I've seen, I only went to see it once at the pictures when it came out. So I did see it on release. It wasn't like a massive watch. It was just a, let's go to the movies and see this new Spielberg movie. Um, but I have visited quite a few times. Just, it's one of those that if it's on, I'll kind of just settle in and watch. Like it's one of those movies. Like, oh, catch me if you can. It's up to this. I'll watch to the end of this, no matter where it is. So it's one of those for me. But yeah, I've, I've probably seen it about five or six times since it's, since it's come out. No, no, that's that's pretty cool actually. It's. I mean, I've seen it twice, and the second was yesterday. And um, the background for me of this is I saw this. <sighs> Remember when you're younger and, and you'd be allowed to like rent a video from Blockbuster. So. Yeah, hey, hey, we had it as well. It's, I'm not mocking your age here. I was part of the generation too. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to distinctly remember what year it was because if we were at our old house, it would have been like pre 2003. I don't think it was. I think it was here in the summer. We'd always be able to like rent rent a video. Uh, you know, I'd get one. My sisters would get one, and my parents would get one or whatnot. Yeah. It was always a summer thing because if you can see behind me, we still like buying our films. And um, I just have this distinct memory of. Amy Adams as a nurse, and that's a really weird thing to say. But obviously, as a kid, it's not meant in a weird way. Um, but <laughs> I was a bit I older. Was... I remember Amy Adams as a nurse too. Uh... <laughs> it, it's it's one of them where, like, my memories like I'd seen it when I was younger, but I just remember the ending. I remember the factory. I remember him getting a job at the FBI, and Amy Adams as a nurse. Very random, random moments indeed, and. I was just trying to piece when I might have seen it, but it must have been. We had a VHS player like active probably until like 2006, so it would have been like nice. probably maybe 2004 or five. Um, yeah, yeah. Again, I wouldn't have known who Spielberg was. I knew who Leonardo DiCaprio was because I had seen Titanic. I knew who Tom Hanks was because it was Woody out of Toy Story. But this was um, I didn't know this was a Spielberg film until like many many years later. And what's kind of surprising me was watching it yesterday again. It's it's one that I've you know I've been on Blu-ray for a while. I just, I'm not letting memories of it because I know the plot, I know the story. It's not hard, and I remember enjoying it. But I sort of looked at the running time. Sorry to tell the story again. I was like, two hours twenty five. I was like, I thought this is like an hour and forty minutes. And that is, and you know what? I said it to you before we hit live. The pacing is outrageously yeah. excellent. That did not feel like a two and a half hour long Steven Spielberg film. And I don't, I don't know how it was so quick because at no point does it ever feel. Like not that you're checking the time, but I'm kind of going to sort of bounce this over to you as well. That we see his life, but you don't ever feel like there's one scene too many with him at a certain age. It just flows yeah. so well. There is no point between you're absolutely right. There's no point where you're sitting with drags at any point. You have to have so many story beats to kind of flow through, and the play them really quite rapidly from like when you're a kid to his first reception in his class. class. And then he kind of skipped to where he's there in trying to, trying to, you know, there's a lawyer, 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 lawyer first, then on the doctor, and then, and then it's, just, it's, it's just this imagination, cash, cash, cash and then the investigation is going on, and it's, and it's so well, so well, well at first. But we can we can't get all the long point, the point is when he's in this place where we go, where he's, uh, it's kind of this kind of movie, kind of sequence, I think, it's slightly longer than that point, 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 how he's coming to everybody, 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 Kids, 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 yeah, and it's one of these things, though, with this series, you know, we've looked at Spielberg, we've seen um, almost every entry has probably been two plus hours since, uh, I want to say Twilight Zone, which is probably about, God, maybe like 14, 15 films ago. No, uh, Last Crusade, maybe. And 
it's one of those where, like, again, I was not worried. I thought oh, I didn't realize this film could be so long, but it, yeah. it, it just flew by. It, it was it was a great treat watching and kind of like, you know, moving it into some of the behind the scenes if we want to look into that. This is a story in its own right. So obviously, it's a based off an autobiography, of course, from Frank Abagnale. The film rights were sold in 1980, and this is what really surprised me. It just sat in development hell for like, de- and you get stories of films being sat in development hell for like decades. But this is one where, certainly looking over this series, Spielberg normally just picks a film. Right, that's the one I've seen. I'm going to do that. That's going to be mine down the line. And this is one where it was sort of thrown around. And he came on at the last minute, which really surprised me. So um, a bit of background. So DreamWorks purchased the rights in 97. So just different studios had them for 17 years. And David Fincher was attached to it, which I, I mean, I'm a massive Fincher fan. I can't see this being a very different movie. version, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, like, could, like, I'm just sort of sat there saying, like, how, how on earth would I mean, you'd probably have Kevin Spacey as you know Tom Hanks's character for a start, but I'm just trying to picture a, a David Fincher like version. Like, would he make them fly planes for real? Then it's <laughs> it's sort of really weird. And he dropped out to Panic Room, which I've not seen. Um, one of the last ones I need to see of his. Then Gore Verbinski came in, which really surprised me, only because I've never seen a film of his prior to Pirates of the Caribbean. Um, he dropped out. Um, and the reason why is because Leo had signed on to do Gangs of New York first, which to me is one of his greatest ever roles. Um, and also it's one of my favourite Scorsese films. I'm just setting away into another great director. And he didn't want to wait. I'm going to assume Pirates of the Caribbean might have cropped up, because if you think in like 01... Oh, one time, and that came out in 03. You'd imagine there was probably talk there. And then Spielberg, who was just producing it because he owned DreamWorks, just decided to take over. Uh, he liked the look of it. He jumped on board, and the two films he passed on to do this was Big Fish and Memoirs of a Geisha. Now, I've not seen either. Have you? Because I feel like I've spoken about I've not seen Memoirs of Geisha. I've seen Big Fish. It is an excellent film. Hugh McGregor is absolutely stunning in that movie. It's also Tim Burton as well. Yeah, yeah, it's it's bizarre. It has Burton all over, like a big paintbrush of Burton right through. But it, it, I can't recommend it. It's a really, really great film. And could you imagine a Spielberg version of that in its own right? I'm just, you know, what? I mean, not really. This when you watch this movie, it looks like a Spielberg movie. It feels like a Spielberg movie that the color palette he has that just almost like a childlike feel because. Uh, Leo's character is supposed to be quite young at the start, but you do get that childlike feel all the way through, even towards the the end. He's still got that quality about him, and I think Spielberg is really good with that sort of late teen, early twenties person like character, and builds the almost the film around the way it looks, the way it's set, and I just can't, yeah, I can't picture him doing. Big Fish would have been a very different film under his guidance. No, I'm going to say that it is one on the list, you know, a big kind of viewing. And uh, yeah, just, I think Tim Burton, he has such a distinctive style that you just can't see anyone doing a Tim Burton film that's not Tim Burton, um, yeah. which is sort of weird in its own right. But yeah, it's another Ewan one to watch, as you said. And and kind of with this is our Spielberg taking over, it filmed after Minority, just before Minority Report was released in the same year to get a Christmas release shooting at the start of the year, a 50 day, 52 day shoot over 147 locations, which. I don't, I mean, when someone says 147 locations, I'm sort of sat there like, are you doing like guerrilla filmmaking or do you have a second AD unit? Like how how, how specific is a location? Is it four rooms in the same house counting as four locations? Because I find that pretty hard to believe that you can do 147 locations. In, and listen, it's Steven Spielberg, so he, he, I can believe actually. But yeah. Um, <laughs> Again, just I'm just taking into the fact that it's kind of the same as Minority Report because I absolutely love that film. And I'm not just saying it, anyone that's been following this channel, do check out it from last week. It's our longest entry yet, two hours, ten minutes, one of the most incredible nice. discussions. I'm not saying this hasn't been great so far, this has. Thanks. Just, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. I forget. Yeah, yeah, we've got, we got to talk about Tom Cruise finally. Um, we don't get to see that often. Asterisk Top Gun. Um, but anyway, moving on from uh, Tom Cruise, we'll get to Leo later. Um, wait, has Leo done a film of Tom Cruise? Now that is something I've just decided I want to see. Box um, office right there. <laughs> that would be like just those two clashing in some way would be remarkable. Um, 
Let's talk the direction, though. You, you mentioned it. this very much feels like a Spielberg film, which I'm kind of with you on 100%. This feels so Spielbergian. That We'll speak about the music as well, and I feel like that plays a massive part in it. And you've mentioned as well about, you know, almost the childlike performance from Leo. How do we feel about his direction in this film? You know, it, it feels, and I'm just going to, this feels like an, an unhandy compliment, but yeah, at this point in time, in 2002, he's won two Oscars for directing, one for best film as well. To me, he's the greatest act director of all time. I'm a sort of entering this, I don't want to call it like a post saving private run. I don't want to say he's peaked either because that's really disrespectful and he definitely hasn't. But at this point in time, it's safe to say that Steven Spielberg doing a real life drama, it's not that it's not a big challenge. He's done so many of them, we can expect it to be great. Uh, and I don't want to sit here and start on the internet, people. I've got such high expectations, blah, blah, blah. But kind of when a Spielberg film comes out now, it's like, to it's Spielberg film, it's going to be great. And we know it because it's him. That's how Catch Me If You Can feels to me. I don't mean that to undersell it. Does that make any sense to you? No, I, I get that because it does, as I say, it does have a complete Spielberg feel about it. But it feels like, Spiel, you're right, he's, he's hit this real crescent with... Stephen Pryor Ryan and Forrest Gump. Uh, so he's at this, not Forrest Gump. Uh, <laughs> I'm thinking of Tom Hanks. That's who just came off of Philadelphia and <laughs> no, Forrest Gump. Um, it still helps them as well, doesn't it? It builds towards yeah. that. So it's, they're on this sort of crescent. And I just think he's obviously done a lot of like your Schindler's List and your Minority Report. So he's been in very, very set like uh, genres of movies. He's doing that. And this feels much more like a, a not it sounds really weird to say it's a, a laid back kind of spielberg film it's kind oh, of goodness. like it's it's a bit it's it's comedy and it's got a bit of drama in there but it's not like he's got set stuff that's got to be like oh it's all death and destruction of these worlds got he's shooting in the shooting 50s he's shooting pan and pilots and it just looks like he, he had a good time with it i just think it looks a really gentle Spielberg, but really well executed, gentle Spielberg. I'm with you on. The, I think you know what? That's probably the the perfect because I'm just scanning the dramas in my head, and the last one was you know, uh, I mean, I won't count AI Minority Report because they're almost sci-fi, but that's a different genre, different entities of, of especially going to the 20th century. But you've got Saving Private Ryan, you know, one of the most visual war films ever made. You've got Amistad, a film about slavery, which is like terrifying in some scenes. You've got Schindler's List, so you need to say anything else about you know what films able to do. And even in the 80s, you've got sort of the colour purple, um, oh god, uh, not always uh, Empire of the Sun, I mean. And as you kind of said, this is gentle, like the the subject matter is very it's not even a comedic story, but it's the way this story is presented to us. You know, even that logo above us, catch me if you can, it's quite playful, isn't it? And that's how I feel with this. It feels more akin to an Indiana Jones film than his other dramas. That might sound ridiculous now I've said out loud, but I'd imagine there was an atmosphere on set where this was probably really exciting for a lot of people. That you've got you've got this young, uh, I mean, he's not up and coming, but you've got this A-lister that's quite young in Leo. You've got the household name of Tom Hanks, like Spielberg, who has sort of dominated the 90s as an actor. And it's it's them two coming together for, as you said, a, a playful film about you know a, a crook on the run and, and how are we going to be able to, to catch him? And I think one thing I want to bring up is that this is the first film Spielberg has done, not based off real life, but the the subject the film is about, Frank Abagnale, is alive uh, at the time of the film being made, which I thought was really interesting. I, I'd never, I've never really seen a biopic in that regards before. It's, it happens all the time, but I've never looked at one in that respect. And I'd imagine for him, he probably also wanted to to sort of pay respect to. to I mean, he's a crook ultimately, uh, you know, <laughs> the hard, and he's he's done very well with his life after him. And actually, gets some modern day yeah. stuff, which is quite insane too. But I'd imagine it's a different entity, knowing that the person exists, their family are still here, um, and there's probably a bit of not pressure per se, but he's probably there, like bloody hell, like Steven Spielberg's doing a film about me. And you've got yeah. Leonardo DiCaprio to play me. Um, how do you th do you feel that might be involved in the sort of tone it comes across us? Because I'm just trying to think of a David Fincher version now, and there's no way that could have ever been like this ever. Not at all. 
<laughs> not at all. Yeah, I think you, I think you have to look at it very much differently if you're doing a biopic when that person is going to be there, not only to critique. I don't know how involved he was with the actual production or if he even had any sort of say on production. Like, I really want, I think I looked like Leo when I was younger. Sure you did, Frank. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but yeah, I think you have to tread these things more lightly. I know you, you get films like there's the Marilyn Monroe one coming out with Anna de Arnaz, and they're like, the family have said, well, yeah, it's it's the feel of Marilyn. It's maybe not exactly what she was like, but it's just that sort of, to have someone who's going to be able to see the film and talk about it and be probably asked at this point to then do more interviews with papers and things, and you want them to speak on a way like, yeah, I love this film. It's a great interpretation of the story. So, yeah, I think it would play into how you shot and then put this character on screen. No, very well said. Now, I've got the pull quotes because I did a bit of digging on this. So, Frank Abanel did do interviews, um, and he said he's not a consultant on the film. He never met or spoken to Spielberg, and he didn't read the script. Nope. But he said he didn't want to. Uh, he didn't want to, sorry. And uh, Spielberg told the writer, who is Jeff Nathanson, that he wanted complete accuracy in the relationships and the scams that he was involved in. And he said that he wanted the important message about family, childhood, and divorce being at the forefront. Which is a really interesting answer because it's a very smart political way for him to answer it. You know, I don't want to be involved, but it's Spielberg. Um, but kind of following on from that, so across this series, you know, we've spoke so much about Spielberg's got the the, the sort of the broken family dynamic very much mm -hmm. when he yeah. was younger. His parents divorced as a teenager, and with this film, Frank's parents do divorce when he's a teenager, and and this was a really really interesting sort of sub narrative, especially with Christopher Walken. Uh, playing Frank Senior. Um, I keep saying Frank Jr. I think I'm talking about bloody friends, um, which is Leo in this. But <laughs> I, because again, I, you know, I've not known that much of Spielberg's personal life until then. Obviously, Fablemans is probably going to really delve into that this year for the first time. Us as an audience gets to gets to potentially see some of that stuff. But I think that's the attraction right there for him. Probably if if the character's been through something potentially similar, I don't know the context of. I mean, I do know the context of Spielberg's parents divorcing, but it's not presented on the film like this. Um, it's very interesting that the character has this obsession with his dad, and his relationship is more of his that's, father, and and yeah. the real life stuff really surprised me, and it's actually quite sad in a way that Frank never met his dad from the day he ran out. Till the day yeah. his dad passed away, um, they, they there wasn't letters, there wasn't communication, but he had very, very, very fond memories of his father, which is really nice things to hear. That because we'll get into characters later, but um, Chris Walken and this is like one of the most un Christopher Walken but Christopher Walken performances of all time. It's safe to say, and and it's got its own subplot, but again, it's Spielberg. I feel in, having a very mature, more mature take on the family dynamic because. I think the film's great when you've got Leo on the run, Tom Hanks chasing him. But if you don't have that hook with the certainly with Amy Adams with the family stuff, I don't think you can get not attracted to Leo because everyone is. But I don't think you can maybe understand him as the lead that he's a crook, yeah. but why do we love him? And it's that that I think we understand his family background with it. Yeah, and I think it's really interesting that obviously a lot of Spielberg's early films where the mother was the main the, the the family member who'd stayed it was always the dad who was kind of away at this point in i think spielberg's life he'd kind of almost forgiven his father for what happened obviously uh, if you're going to but his father caught his mother cheating and then his father left for the sake of the family um and spielberg had always kind of like been with his mother but at that time in his life he kind of turned it around where he's got the forgiveness i think that really really comes through in the relationship with Frank and his dad, I really think that it, he kind of tells that story in this, that obviously the wife is having affairs and behind Christopher Wharton's back. I just think it's, yeah, it's a real turn for Spielberg in the way he feels about his father. He shot this. And I think it, it comes across massively in this for me, that that relationship is, is essential to the story. Uh, I love that we get to go back to Frank, uh, Frank senior throughout the story and just those little moments and little beats with walk and then um leo are incredible seeing the bar when he tries to give him the cadillac and things uh, oh, where are you going frank where are you going ah oh, amazing 
it's it's so good and, and without jumping to end when you get that sort of devastating revelation that he died and it's it's so back on what as i like yeah he's dead he like fell on the stairs and, and broke his neck and you're there like we spent so much time with john Voight, uh, not john Voight, sorry uh with Walken, and it's like <laughs> this kind of feel, you? uh <laughs> it, it, it it's really interesting that it's not i don't think he's even done for us to view with the shock twist either it is just done as a this this has yeah. happened he has been on the run for so long and it's a very powerful moment because the relationship of 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 course Tom Hanks and Leo is really not sells the film alongside Frank and his dad it's it, again it, it's a game between two oh, I'm trying to think of, I'm trying to think of a comparison I don't want to go in styles it's too easy but it's it's you know like when there's like that mutual respect between like a villain and a hero and it's yeah, like yeah. You know, do we are we finally gonna have to fight it out? It, it feels like it's something probably going Fast and Furious, not Star Wars, to be honest. But it's <laughs> it's it's really interesting. But sort of jumping into the to the direction, I actually really want to touch on one thing as well. Uh, as you know, we are nearing the 60th anniversary of James Bond. Steven Spielberg almost did a James Bond film, uh, and then he didn't get it, so he just you know just casually made Indiana Jones and George Lucas. Not a big deal. <laughs> and um. In this, we we maybe have one of his dreams fulfilled. We and yeah. I did not. This is the thing, right? When I said I saw Sonja Junga, I did not know there was Bond references in this film. And and you know what? It makes such sense oh, yeah. because this is obviously set in the sixties. And one thing I was thinking is that I'd imagine Spielberg Spielberg was probably at a similar age to Frank as well mm-hmm. when this film yeah. was set. You know, he'd have been his early twenties towards the back end of the sixties and. The, the Bond stuff just really got me going. And it was, you know what is even weird? I don't know if I sent this to you. This will be way out of date by the time the video goes up. <laughs> um, when I was watching it, about 10 minutes before the scene, and this isn't me lying, I saw the photos of the renovated Lego store in London. And I've seen that there's a Lego DB5. So I sent that around to a load of people. And literally 10 minutes later, in, when I'm watching the film, he gets the DB5 in the suits and... Yeah. I just thought, you know, what a great moment because this film's been fun. It's been exciting. And what I like is that Eon have obviously given Spielberg the go-ahead. Like, yes, to use a clip from Goldfinger because, you know, it's not an advert for the film. It's not mocking it. It's not taking the mick, but it's just really well placed. Yeah. And it makes sense, right? If, if you were a con man in the 60s, I would probably buy the Sean Connery yeah. Goldfinger suit. I couldn't of pull it off. Of course you would. That. <laughs> yeah, and it's like you know, you'd get a DB five if you could as well. Like oh. it's uh, it's a little thing and uh, sorry. It's no no, I'm saying it's it's such a good moment. I, I literally just want to talk that moment he's just sat in the cinema and you can see behind his eyes that he's watching Sean Connery's performance and thinking, That's who I wanna be, that's how I wanna style my life. To then go get the this is the exact suit, this is definitely the suit he wears to get the car. And then we get Jennifer Garner's appearance in the movie as well. Uh, there's the goldfish lady to uh, in a weird, bizarre what two minutes she's in that movie and gone. Very weird, it's, uh, yeah. But uh, still great that she comes and says, Oh, Jennifer Garner, okay, she's that's it, she's out of the movie. But no, it's I love the Bond thing when he, he gets the car and you get the, just the, the music cue play. It's just oh, brilliant. They did very well to get those rights. That's all I'm gonna keep guessing. And again, you know, not to turn into a Bond conversation, but. One thing I miss most about Star Wars post George Lucas is you know how George Lucas loves people to have a bit of fun. You can take the mick with Star Wars, you can parody it, do whatever you want. He was very open with it. You don't get that too much with Bond, but when it has been done like this, it's a really nice idea. And ultimately, I think because it does tie into Spielberg wanting to do a Bond, I mean, he literally got Sean Connery and Indiana Jones as well to play Indiana Jones's dad, which is the ultimate <laughs> sign of respect. Uh, Okay, I couldn't do a Bond film, so I'm just going to cast James Bond as my James Bond's father. It's it's perfect, and it's such a great little moment. I just really wanted to bring that up because you know, any yeah. chance to talk about Bond, and you know, I don't know if Spielberg will ever do a Bond film. We won't ever rule it out, but you know, it would be interesting if, if anything did come of it. Um, but moving on from some of the direction, I want to talk to you about the story because we've kind of mentioned it's a, it. You mentioned earlier the selling point that it's we spoke about the family relationship, the actual the crook of it. How do you feel about having this crook as the lead character and not having, you know, nine out of ten films would probably have the FBI agent as the as the main character, right? And you'd follow them chasing the crook, whereas actually, you know, we've got the ultimate, you know, the face and heel swap where it's Leo is the good guy but villain and Tom Hanks is the one you don't want to succeed but kind of do. It's 
a really easy i think for this one it's depends on the level of crook you're looking at a lot of people will go to a movie and this is about the villain and it depends on how villainous they are stealing money from the american government he's not stealing from other people he's not stealing from poorer people than him he knows his position in life and he's trying to bet himself and i think because it's he's taken on the government he's taken on the fbi that level of villainy is very forgivable for an audience. That's something that people can kind of get on board with and go, you know what? I could, I'd, I'd do that. I'd, I'd definitely do that. That's not, that's not hurting anybody. Like that, you're going to say that's just people in gray suits in the background. I think that is a very easy sell for people to then go. This is our main character, and yes, he's the, he is committing crimes, but you're going to go on this journey with him and actually be on his side and wanting him to do this. So yeah, I think it's, a, it's a really good uh, to have it at that point of view. I really think it's. It's an easy sell for that. No, I'm mean, guys. I'm kind of with you on that. It makes it easy for us as a viewer. It makes it entertaining. And yeah, you know, I said no one's, you know, no one's really going to be like anti-government. And when it's set in the '60s as well, it, it's that kind of like innocence. I found Spielberg is actually speaking about it, where he sort of called Frank a 21st century genius um, set in the 1960s, and it's kind of right because if you know watching this film today. Again, this is a period piece. I'm not going to do the whole old plot twist this or, you know, uh, ex- oh, you know, the awful plot holes thing people do for anything like nitpicking. <laughs> What's the word nitpicking? Obviously, if this was today, it would never happen because we're in the digital era. But what I think makes this so fascinating is, in you know, when you think of the 60s, it, not just Bond because we've spoken about it, but you think of Bond, you think of like hippies, you know, you've moved on from that 50s American diner thing and and now we know we're in like the swing of 60s, everything, and it would be the era. Okay, I think Austin Powers as well. That's also why, but <laughs> it is the era where I'd imagine you start to get more technological advancements where you know computers have been made, but they aren't a household thing and they still won't be for many decades. And it's kind of like the, the beginning of the the modern the six what would you call like the, the six? Is it like the end of the to me, it's like the end of the sort of the, the immediate post-war era, where like yeah, I think yeah, of the seventies yeah. as like a very much cinema-wise, like a rebirth of cinema in the seventies. But I feel like the the sixties are that end of post World War Two stuff for me, and the seventies is like a new sort of stretch within itself. It's very weird. Someone's going to probably be fuming in the comments, um, but I hope that makes some form of sense to somebody. And it kind of makes sense with this film setting that you, he would get away with that in the sixties. Like it's, it's really interesting finding out how he does it, you know, when he's sort of trying to get on like the stewardesses and um, we've got um, an amazing cameo from a very young, as I say, cameo, it wouldn't have been intended as a cameo. It's just that uh, Elizabeth Banks has obviously gone on to become you know, a very successful actress following this film. And it's great. She's got this one minute in there. Um, and I think it's little things like that, which really, not just separate the film from other stuff, but you see these actresses popping up here and there. And again, because it's Leo, you can understand why they're flattered by him and what he's doing. It's absolutely, I mean, I love the Pan Am stuff. I love the the whole take that he is still this kid at heart. Like that, that feeling of him right through the movie, that never changes at all from him storing bits of paper that he's, peeled off the bottles in his wallet to the name himself after cartoon character uh, comic characters all the way through yep. the different guises that he has this, he's, he's like a child at play in everything he does he kind of takes it on with that like especially the pilot stuff he sees a pilot like i'm gonna go dress up like a pilot now and do what i need to do i'll watch what they do and go copy it and I, 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 that whole pan am thing going through the the girls where he has the auditions just amazing that like, the, the power and the draw that someone has because he puts on a white you like that hat and the uniform i just it's just a great start but i think yeah you just you never lose that identity that he is still really young because of the way he's acting around those things as well yes he's pulling off some amazing feats of uh lies and things like that and scams but he's still a kid and that plays in all of that as well no, very well said. Actually, moving into characters, we spoke about Leo a fair amount. How do we feel? I mean, we spoke, you know, we, we like him as Frank. How do you feel like this is a, as a Leonardo DiCaprio film? Like, not is this one of his best, but for an actor that I and many others could argue is the best of a generation, um, 
this is like one of to me his standout performances, and I think it's because he's not really done one like this since. There's it's almost, but when how do I, I'm trying to sorry, I'm trying to make it sound like normal. When I think of Leo, I've got like two eras, and I think certainly growing up, you know, I was seven or well, six when this came out. Sorry, you sort of hated Leo when you're younger, like as you like you maybe you're 10, 11, it's like, oh, that guy from Titanic and Raymond Juliet. And you don't really get to appreciate it until you're in like your late teens, same as Brad Pitt. And then you start looking at the careers. Like, Actually, they were like pretty phenomenal from the get go. Like, why did I dislike him? Was it envy? I don't know because I absolutely love him. <laughs> um, and with this, I always think actually, become that it's like to me the last young Leonardo DiCaprio film, which is bonkers because yeah. this is out after yeah. Gangs of New Year, Gangs of New York, and that's <laughs> <laughs> when I think of that, I think of like, yes, this is like A-list top of his game, Leo. Yeah. And actually, it's it's the same. It's just me yeah. having this personal observation. I think it just goes to what level of an actor he was at this point as well. Like for him to pull it off, where you think, oh, is that is he this an easy film for him? Is it before he know that he's this is Leo that is he's performed for Spielberg, he knows he's in a Spielberg film, and he is he's acting and this is really really great and i think behind shutter island which is a very different film i would watch this over shutter island or anything because shutter island's a it's one of those films that you watch once and you don't watch for a little while because who needs that in your life um but it's such a good performance and this i would put right up there as one of his top performances one of my favorite performances certainly i just think he looks so at home with spielberg and it, with the actual story and the character he's playing you just really fits that role so well no I'm, I'm with you on that I, I think it's, you've got to put it at the top and with his career where we've seen him move on as well there's there's very few things like it as, as far as I'm concerned and what sort of follows on with Leo is not I'm just looking at Gangs of New York was the same year which is incredible he can drop this in Gangs of New York in the same year that, that's insane Scorsese and Spielberg films but we've also got Tom Hanks uh, and listen Tom Hanks is as we sort of said you know he's one of the we say he dominated the 90s. He's one of the best hats of all time. Um, not, uh, I'm still thinking of Elvis. The, the, the online version has been really such a lot of memes. Uh, yes. the last two. One thing that really surprised me, and I haven't seen The Sopranos, and it's been overdue on my list. James Gandolfini was originally cast in this role, and he had to leave oh, wow. to go and do The Sopranos, uh, which is quite quite a bit of difference there. Um, I can't not see Tom Hanks in this role, but then I can also see James Gandolfini in this role, if that makes sense. I think because it's a Spielberg film, the the Tom Hanks is like the accustomed insert Tom Hanks here performance. Yeah, I get that. I'd, I'd be really interested to actually see how Gandolfini would have played it and to see what difference it would have made on his career as a screen actor rather than a... T- I mean, don't get us wrong. No one's going to say Sopranos is a bad turnout for your career and to hang your hat on that is not a bad thing. But I'd be very interested to see where it would have taken him if it had taken him in a very different direction. Had, especially had they not changed sort of the character beats are probably going to be very the, the script was probably locked. So that's not going to change much. And it's just then how that actor betrays that with the same words. So I think it'd be really interesting. But yeah, it, it fits Tom Hanks so well. Him and Leo bounce off each other so well without really without meeting each other that like very rarely through the movie. They're over the phone apart from which is probably my favorite scene in the hotel room where he scams with the, the wallet, which I just yes. think is just oh chef's kiss for how much I love that scene. And it's that keeping them apart, but having them build a relationship at the same time. And Hanks, you're right, he's come off like he's done as Philadelphia, he's done as Forrest Gump. He's he's again, he's right up there with his acting career. He's gone past all of his early like splash things like that. So He's done Ryan as well, so he's uh, yeah, I, I just he's perfect for the role as well. No, I can with it, and I think is this his second? It's only his second Spielberg film, which is crazy. When he obviously goes on yeah, to yeah. so many more, including next week's, which we'll get to a little bit later on. Um, but as I we want to talk about Christopher Wilkin, who you know is a legend uh, to, to many people, mysterious as well. Certainly, some mysterious events on uh, on boats, which you know is very up in the air still. Um, Playing Frank Cameron's scene. Now, this really surprised me. He won a BAFTA for this film, for this performance. And listen, I think he's great. I don't think he's that good. And I don't mean that in a disrespectful tone. And he's been nominated for an Oscar. Without his character, this film to me doesn't function. Leo's character can't work. 
And you need an actor with a presence to not just be the dad of, of Leo in this case. You, he's got to be that family man that you sort of empathize that you see him as a postal worker and you know that's like a disappointment for, for, for Frank in this and then you have to think about what other characters you know you've got another family of in-laws where you've got like John Voigt which having like Walken as a potential dad and John Voigt as a father-in-law uh, not John Voigt sorry what earth one about Martin Sheen um, <laughs> I've, I've said that a few times I've just said the John Voigt that's twice now yeah yeah uh, that's, next that's, is the John I, Voigt I write uh, him in the schedule. Why have I wrote him in the schedule? I don't know. That would be a very, very different film. Um, <laughs> dear me, what a shocker. No, Martin Sheen, obviously. Um, and all I can think of is Uncle Ben now, which is really a shame because he's done so much more. Another TV, obviously, Legend of the Norseys. How are we feeling with, with Frank Sr.? The whole... I mean, we spoke about it a little bit, but I think the scenes we have him in, I wouldn't say he steals them, but he just has this, this immeasurable calmness that we've not had... I don't feel we've had it from him in that many films. He's a very yeah. mature Welkin in this. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, the last thing I'd seen probably him in before this was probably the bitten um, Pulp Fiction. It was probably the last thing I kind of noticed walking in. Um, but he comes up again. He's already that. He's what Frank is destined, could be destined to become. The guy who is fighting the government still, who's got that fake necklace always in his hand. See if you drop this. He's still trying to run the scams, but he's still the guy who loves his wife. He, and even from the start of the film, I think he knows he's destined to lose her. Like, he knows that he's not taking money and the government are shutting down their businesses. No, he's got as the car. Um, and they say running scams from literally moment one. To get the suit, um, for, is it going to court? The, I can't remember the game for, but they are trying to get a suit. Um, and I just he plays it so effortless, effort, effortlessly. Him telling that same story that he has for anything about the two mice in the in the in the milk to turn it one turns it to butter, and he sells it so well. And even you hear it over and over again. It's just like I can't picture anybody else playing that role. That would then have the same effect on Frank Jr. The devastation he sees as his father's getting older but not changing, and his father seeing right through him as well. Like at every moment, his father sees his son, a, a boy, doing this stuff. And no matter even the moment where he seems slightly impressed with him, like they're all looking at you, and they say, Where you go? And Frank storms out of the, the bar. It's just a wonderful moment of this father who can see himself and his son and what he's done to him. But yeah, yeah the walk and no one would sell like Walken does. I could talk about that. Um, forever. <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm with you. It, it, it's, it's just, it's, it's the great, the great moment with the, 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 the French lesson. And then when he gets caught and his, you know, Walken just does the smile with him. And it's, it's the bonds like that, that I think look so easy and look so real, but I genuinely think it's moments that the actors, you can see through actors at that point if they're up front and if they're not, and that's when chemistry kicks in. It's little individual moments, and we see that throughout. And I really want to quickly bring Amy Adams uh, because I love Amy yeah. Adams. She's been one of my favorite actresses over the years. Like Leonardo DiCaprio, she's bided her time for an Oscar. It's still not here. I think she's had seven nominations now. Um, hopefully, it does come sooner rather than later because she's a, a wonderful actress. And I was like really surprised that not only was this sort of one of her first roles, but I was reading that. She didn't get cast anything for like a year until after this came out, which which really surprised me. And I think with me, like my intro to Amy Adams was probably well, this obviously, as I mentioned earlier, but the the fighter with Christian Bale. That was one of the first ones yeah. I saw her in, and she's phenomenal in that film. And she's just she's one of the best actresses of a generation. Or actor. I always feel really bad with actresses. Like do you call them actors or actresses or both? Uh, you know, I don't ever mean to discredit, I'm just so used to sort of saying both words. But in this film, like, I feel like we get to see a sign of her career to come. Like, yes, she's got the ridiculous braces, and that's very much, you know, <laughs> that's part of the comedy, right? It's that she's yeah, the, yeah. the very sad nerd, and she's got a real, like, devastating backstory with it that the, you know, the, the dad's friend that got her pregnant, and it's sort of um and an ahring, you know, is that a bit of Peter Fedlia? You know, all that sort of weird stuff that comes into it, but you've got the emotional baggage that, the, 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 in a disrespectful term, that this is the the character that changes Frank. That this is the person he genuinely falls in love with. That he wanted to to put his crown. You've just got this wonderful moment 
when Tom Hanks is starting to realise when Leo's trying to make a deal, isn't he? Tom Hanks like, yeah, we're close, we're close, and it's such a great moment. And the whole the engagement party and it, the money, it, it's such a wonderful subplot. And kind of what we said earlier, the film's two and a half hours long, and you just don't you don't notice it because they've done almost it's almost like the opening act is Leo on the run. It's almost like the middle act is is his relationship, yeah. and. I just think she's extraordinary. Again, she's one of my, she's my favorite actresses, so I'm not going to say anything bad because there's nothing bad to say. She's wonderful. No, I mean she's really good in this. From the moment you meet her in that candy stripe, uh, as the outfit for what to say that mouthful of metal, and it's that she's still playing such a young girl. Maybe not physically, but she's almost like she's mentally certainly a, a bit younger than she is for the job. I think just the way she has. The brace, the way she talks, and the when he's trying to charm her just to find it to get the charts, and obviously to find if he can get a job, and then you see her mature quite quickly through it as she starts to fall in love with him, and she loses the braces, and they she gets he gets her back with her family because they think he's a doctor and a lawyer, and um, how did you pass the bar? We don't know. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it just I think her performance in that lined her up for so much because she does go through this massive range from the little girl you meet to the girl that then is devastated selling him out. So she still does what the FBI tell her, but she's sitting in that car at the end when she knows she's that's it, it's done, she's lost forever, and she's devastated. And the scene of him at the engagement when he's stuffing all of that money into the the briefcase and it's fluttering around the room and outside the hall it shot so wonderfully that her discovery of the real person that she she loves is not who she thought it was it's such a, she's got this range from the start to that point there and it's it is magnificent performance it's the innocence of it as well that, and i feel that's a harder emotion to convey because it, it's very physical you know when when tom max goes in the room with the fbi and she's just sort of stood against the wardrobe with the money and again credit to Tom Hanks it's all full in direction all the same thing Trevor he puts the gun away like he knows like ah like she's just found out and it's again it's such an underrated moment and I don't think the film can function without that without as we said the family and relationships oh, no, definitely not. Adams, you wouldn't feel anything for the character except the fact he's a crook this is what makes him not likable but makes him feel like a real person at least yeah um and that is until a little bit later, which we'll get to. But sort of pressing on, um, if we want to speak about the man, the myth, the legend, John Williams, as we always do on this series. Um, before we came on, you said straight away, what an unbelievable score. Um, this is one of his more unique scores, because not only do we have a Spielberg opening animated credit sequence, which I absolutely love, um, John Williams' score in this stands out, and it's meant in a respectful manner, that... Every week I come on here and say his scores are great. So I get really, and I say this every week, so I'm bored of saying I say this every week now as well. Um, I don't feel like I've heard a Williams score like this before. And he just gets, he just gets it. He knows exactly, this is the film Spielberg's doing. Somebody on the run. You're going to laugh a bit. You're going to maybe cry a bit. You're going to have a range of emotions. But ultimately, as you said, it, it's a charming film and it's gentle. The score to accompany that, it's not big brass instruments. It's not like, you know, just piano medleys. It's the perfect score for Catch Me If You Can. Does that sound weird? No, not at all. It's um, He's a massive fan of jazz, John Williams, and he was given the freedom of right um, Spielberg to go, look, do what you want to do to put this in this jazz. And he's just got the piano motifs and the, the theme right through the beginning feels like a sixties TV show. Like you would say yes. like, Oh, it's you kind of feel what you like for like a persuade or something just like that. It's, I, I love this score. I think it's so uniquely, oops, sorry, uniquely different from what has gone before and not something you expect from Williams. You expect a big orchestral, you don't get that, and I think it's wonderfully underplayed, but still feels huge. I love it. I love this the, the theme on this. 
No, and with and obviously betting that, of course, it was nominated for an Oscar for best sound. And anyone that watched Minority Report last week, I was raving about that Minority Report soundtrack. And I'm going to say it once again: 2002, John Williams did Minority Report, did an episode two Attack of the Clones, Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, and Minority Report. There's probably going to be something really obvious that I've missed, but The Legend is just in so many film scores, I just can't keep count. Um, I probably missed something really obvious now. I've said that out loud, but what a year for him as well, by the way. Those four scores, phenomenal, and all of them. Three of them do use the same theme at one point, but four vastly <laughs> very different genres and yeah. scores, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but if we want to kind of move into sort of the sort of legacy of the film, box office, lovely surprise, made three hundred fifty million off a of fifty more budget, phenomenal success uh, in regards to that Minority Report same year, three hundred and seventy million, I think. So that's a, a two big hits back to back for Spielberg. Um, same calendar year, which again I'm just get, trying to get over an Oscars. I mentioned previously two nominations, best score for Mr. Williams and best appointment nomination for, I'm not going to say John Voigt, obviously, Christopher Walker. Why am I, why have I kept saying John Voigt today? He's, he's not been in the Spielberg film, I don't think. Um, I think him and Martin Sheen, like Excellent. one of them sort of feels like, oh, this sounds really, one of them feels like sort of like clean and the other one's like John Voigt, like, <laughs> it's like, like strange, <laughs> but you could both see them being politicians, just want one, a clean politician, if that makes sense. Um, two very different, obviously, families of actors as well is probably also worth a mention. Don't know where Welcome comes from. Um, in regards to that conversation, but what I want to talk to you about, and this this blew my mind. This became a musical in 2011 in America. Oh, really? Why even we had this? Didn't in because that would make a fantastic musical. I think, cause, yeah, I don't know. Um, I do love a musical, it would depend how it's done i don't know if they're using the that john williams sort of sound to it I, that is a bizarre take for me I, i'd very much like to now after this go and search down some of the music and see how much of it's on youtube or somewhere's a, somewhere must have a recording somewhere so it'd be very interesting to hear what the songs are and what it's like but no it's a what a bizarre take for a film to go you know what that definitely is going to be musical uh <laughs> I think it's the score, isn't it? As you mentioned, the jazz that would work on stage. It's, is what? Yeah, where are the songs going to come in? And you know, it's, it's interesting. <laughs> but I think because I'm thinking of that animation, where you style, gonna go, Frank? Where you gonna go? Be excellent. Uh, see there you go. Yeah, if, anyone, if anyone wants me to write the musical, <laughs> Amy Adams can sing. Bring them all back for an anniversary special. But yeah, that was in 2011 uh-huh. in America. I've just. That happened with the color purple. We had a Spielberg musical. So that's two of his films that became musicals, and uh, just a really like interesting one. one to, I mean, obviously, you don't want to save a Private Ryan musical. That'd be very weird. But catch me if you can. It, it's kind of if you're going to call it the films, that's probably one of the ones you say, yeah, musical. Like you could probably poke it at that one. Um, but what I want to kind of jump into really is not talking about how it's perceived today because we spoke wonderfully about this film. Uh, there's been some uh, not. Uh, twists over in real life over the last sort of two, three years, and the FBI was doing their own searches on the real life Frank Abagnale, so he's still alive. Um, it's worth mentioning that also Tom Hanks playing Carl. Carl was not the name of the, the real life FBI agent. Um, but basically the history is very complex. The FBI said, no, he did not work for us. Uh, essentially, that's what they've said. The ending is a lie. Saying that he and they also claiming that he didn't speak to the agent for 20 years after he got arrested, that they just bumped into each other in a park in public. And there's a lot of stories coming out that actually his autobiography, which the film is based off, is a complete lie. And I've kind of been sat here perplexed because it doesn't take any shine off the film for me because I think this is a wonderfully directed film. But what it kind of does is, you know, there's a lot of reports for people to read into, and I believe it's all ongoing still, so I don't really want to comment too much on it. Um, but a lot of history things that show this don't add up. Uh, and this isn't Spielberg, again, this is the, the the book that's based off more so than this film. If the con man has successfully conned the greatest filmmaker of all time into an inaccurate film via an inaccurate autobiography, that is one of the greatest cons of, it, of his life, that you know, whether he was or wasn't involved over the years and got rich, I'm sure he probably was. I, I don't discredit that. Would the FBI admit that they took in a criminal and they used him to help them make millions and, and help, you know, their country and whatnot? That's that's the other question I have. But how does that feel to you that this a lot of this could be a lie that happened? It's 
it's it's quite it's a really interesting one, isn't it? That's probably a better term. It's really interesting, but it also feels like it could be perfect because the film is built on that premise that this guy was the con from the start. And if it comes out that yeah, you know what, most of the books made up, I just did that because I need to write an interesting story. I wanted that out there, needed some money. Why not? It'd be a complete fabrication in, in the most part. There probably is there probably are bits of truth in it. Who's going to not tell the story that they got the DB5? Who's not going to say this is a great moment that I had all this cash and did all this? Everybody would in a story of their life that may then get bought to be a Hollywood movie. And it kind of just goes, yeah, you know what? If that's how it is, fantastic. That just builds on that story for me. No, I'm, I'm kind of with that. It's remarkable. And kind of following on from it, again, it hasn't changed my opinions on this film. It probably hasn't yours too. No. As we said, it's it sort of, no. maybe it's made it more mysterious in an exciting way. I want to kind of jump into any of your favorite scenes because I'm not going to lie, there's, there's not a scene I dislike in this film. But no. if I'm having to pick, it's even hard to pick a favorite scene because you've got great scenes which are the film, the story moving forward. But I just love it every time we get to see him like stealing. And, and conning people like again it, it's the score it's leo it's the way it's shot um but i'm if i had to pick one it'd probably be the first time he meets uh he, he meets tom hanks with the you know oh i'm a secret service i'm barry allen um you know it's not the only flash on the run if we get into real life context who really knows what, what the next <laughs> few weeks can have in store for us with, with stories uh that, that might be ill-timed or it might be oh my god this good one um but it's just such a wonderful... It, it's when you have, you know, like Batman meeting the Joker for the first time, isn't it? It's like, here are the two coming together. And you've just, you just... You don't ever fear for Leo. You just know that he's got Tom Hanks' pocket. And it's such a great scene between the two. And as you said earlier, it's when Tom Hanks realises the wallet and it's got, like, the ketchup bottles in. It's got everything. Like It's so, so well done. Um, what a wonderful scene and a great way to start their relationship properly. Yeah, uh, for me, it, it would absolutely come straight down to that scene as as my favorite in the movie. I, just, I love the whole. He know he gives him his. It's the way he plays him. He gives him his wallet, knowing that he cannot let him open that wallet while he's in that room. The shouting down to the blind, the blind neighbor who's getting guided away, who he knows is yeah. he saw him earlier getting guided away, shouting down. That's him. It's played so well, but there's still tension because Tom Hanks has the wallet in his hand. And if he opens that, it's game over, credits, we're done. I just, it's played with laughs behind it because you're like, oh my God, it's him. And we know it's him. I just, it's definitely my favorite scene in the movie um, without, without, without even having to think about it. That was the one I came to when we first started. It's my favorite scene in it. Yeah, I love it. No, 100%. So there's a lot of great scenes in this. If I'm moving into my final thoughts of this film, it's, it's a wonderful film. I, I don't have superlatives. I don't have, you know, insert insane word here, but it's so enjoyable. And, and when we've been doing this, we're 23, 22 episodes into the series now. And it's so nice to have this film that isn't, as you said, it. it's not as deep. It's not, obviously, I mean, it's based off real life, but it, it's not digging into the horrors of humanity for once. It's a simple crook and hero coming together and it stands out amongst Spielberg's work and it's so Spielberg in its own right but at the same time it sort of just elevates by the fact that you've got two powerhouses in Tom Hanks and Leo DiCaprio the fact Leo's never been with Spielberg since I'm really really surprised about or you know was it was it this perfect timing for one film and be done I, yeah. I don't know what other uh, Spielberg film Leo could have done if I'm being honest that came after this because They've just absolutely nailed it on, on the first film. In. And yeah, I'm a, I'm a very big fan of this. And it, it's hard to put this into words because it is a bit more simple. This is not as much weight. There's not as much leverage. There's not as many themes and ideologies as the last three films. But it's simple. And I'd, I'd be so obvious to say this is probably one of his most popular films um, ever made. That's saying a lot. And I don't talk about box office. I just mean in stature. I think, as I said, it, everyone can tell you, catch me if you can, uh, the story of that. Yeah, I, I, when you first sent out the list of like, are there any films you would like to talk about on this? Catch Me If You Can was one of the first ones that I knew I'd want to come on and talk about because it is right up there for me as 
one of my favorite Spielberg movies. It really is high on that list. I love the performances. I love the actual, just the whole look of it. I love the era it's set in. I love the story. I love the tall tale of it all. I love the con. I love walking and the lies. I just, Every bit of it trips along so well. There's not a moment of boredom in the movie for me. Like I said, there's no moment where it slows down to a, a, to a crawling pace. Him outside of his mother's window in the snow after he gets off the plane is just heartbreaking. Watching his mother dance with somebody else are the, the little kids at the window. Just phenomenal. Him being coaxed out in France to go outside, thinking the police aren't going to be there. Just... There are moments you can just pick from this movie, and uh, it's it's right it's t- right up there with T one Spielberg for me. I love it. No, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm with you on that. <laughs> I'm I'm excited to see what what other people do think, and especially when we get to that top ten list, will it make it into people's top tens? That's the real big question because, as we said, he's yeah. got such a such a stunning uh, filmography over the decade, many decades as well. Incredible. But we want to hear from you, so please do comment your thoughts on Catch Me If You Can. As we said, one of Spielberg's greatest films. Uh, and I think as well, as we said, getting Leo in, we're just curious to see what people think. So please do keep those comments coming. We will reply to all of those in the chat. And if you're a fan of Steven Spielberg and Tom Hanks, why not hit the subscribe button? Because next week is The Terminal, a film I have not seen. Dave will be joining us on that. We're going to have Cam as well from The Spy Hearts as we round out our, uh, oh, was always the the sign of what's to come in his romance films. So that's going to be a very fun review and discussion. So Tom Hanks and Spielberg will reunite the Terminal. Also, bringing up Cassian, I found out today that Cassian is in the Terminal. And I'm absolutely devastated I found that out today. That would have been an incredible surprise for me. Um, <laughs> I say Cassian, I mean Diego Luna, of course. So that's going to yeah. add a little bit of edge for me watching Great. that next week. Um, and again, you know, if people want to find us, you want to find out what videos we're working on, what we're planning, we mentioned Cassie, and there's going to be some Star Wars stuff. There's, of course, we head into September. You best off finding us on our social media as Twitter and Instagram at Cinema underscore Savvy, Facebook and Letterboxd.com slash Cinema Savvy. We have a link to Red Bull in that description below where you can pick up our merch if you'd like to support the channel. It's always appreciated. And if you want to find Dave, which you should, you should have done it by now. He's been on so many of our videos, not just over this year, over the years. Where can the people <laughs> the find time. you? Uh, and, and not uh, why, you can f- uh, yeah, well, <laughs> why yeah i said that last week it's <laughs> really bad it? all the time yeah why would people <laughs> want to find you there's no reason uh you can find me over at the life of brian on youtube uh i am a model work uh, model part work builder mostly but that's getting a bit long on the tooth so i'm maybe changing up on that you can find me over on my twitter at the day of brian as i go through movie watching mainly and what i am viewing and sometimes some delightfully wonderful witty tweets not very often and then a lot of the time you'll find me here sitting next to these guys because i love getting invited on Definitely. So, as said, everyone, please subscribe to Dave on there. And as we'd always do, we'll bring the schedule of what's coming soon. We mentioned we've got the Terminal. We're not too far off now. War of the Worlds, heading to 2005. We've got Munich, and it's made the board. The the, the one, the special one. The, the, the one that's not part of the trilogy, that's part of the series. Of course, Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal School, the 20th of September. We're in a pretty interesting time now. We're, in the, we're a bit firmly in the noughties. Um, yeah. And it's it's crazy how quickly this series has gone. You know, it only felt like yesterday we were starting this, and that was like March. It's now August, which is insane. It's really insane. I mean, this series was prepped in January for people curious about behind wow. the scenes. That's how far back this message went to people asking if they want to come on. So, Dave, as always, thank you so much for jumping on tonight. Anytime, any time. definitely. So, as you said, everybody at home, thank you for watching. Thank you for joining us, and be sure to join us on the next one. Take care.